my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Scott Burgess from the Department of Biological Sciences at Florida State University. Uh, Scott's a population geneticist, ecologist, life history biologist, evolutionary biologist, a little bit of everything. He's studying uh, coral reefs um, in the Indo-Pacific. We have an exciting talk today about cryptic species and coevolution, um, but also has interests here locally in the Gulf with Bryozoan. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Ben, and thanks for the invitation to be here. It's great to make the short trip from Tallahassee to a fellow, fellow Gulf Coast environment. It feels like I'm on St. George Island in the Florida Gulf Coast. Um, so yeah, as Ben alluded to, this is really one half of the research that we do in my lab. The other half is a lot of its uh, local work on bryzoans and crown conch and other systems like that. And so what I'm talking about today is our coral work that we do at Morea. And it's really quite different, but I think what ultimately what ties everything together is my interest in larval dispersal and the evolution of life histories. And this is the story that I'm going to tell that's kind of like four years of trying to figure out what we're actually looking at in order to study larval dispersal and the things I wanted to study. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, discovering these cryptic species and then you know, somewhat accidentally finding that they differ ecologically and then it was just more interesting and we kept doing the next thing and the next thing and we're kind of following down this path. Okay, um, I also want to start by acknowledging my co-authors on a lot of this work, you can see on the slide there, but especially uh, Dr. Erica Johnston, who was a postdoc in my lab for about three years, who's now at the University of Hawaii, but she's really been a really critical contributor to this work and been really important. All right, so I think it's pretty well recognized and accepted that biodiversity is important. But what the reason why biodiversity port is important is not just the number of species. Right? I think we kind of have a lot of evidence to show that what matters is actually functional diversity or that species have different traits, which then perform different functions for an ecosystem. And the diversity in those functions is what allows the ecosystem to maintain its state or to recover from, from a disturbance and to rebound into that current state to maintain some sort of cohesion or resilience. Um, when it comes to corals, the way we usually categorize corals is related to its life history and its morphology. So we might tend to think of corals that are like mounding and big as massive morphologies and they might be stress resistant morphologies in life histories because they resist disturbances but they grow slow we might have corals that we might consider competitive which are like tabulate morphologies and they're branching they're kind of thin they grow fast but they're also impacted by disturbances more often uh, we might have other species which are like smaller body smaller colony sizes they grow really fast they have reproductive strategies which allow them to colonize areas really quickly and that's kind of the way I think that a lot of coral research thinks about biodiversity in corals. And there's some reason for that. It's good because the, you know, the morphology of the coral is it serves a function for habitat. Lots of different things live in different corals and different sizes and different interstitial spaces, host different species. And those species are then food for bigger fish and things like that. Uh, the different morphologies and life histories, the different contributors to primary reef growth and the rate of accretion and the density of the rock and things like that. And then when they die and become rubble, those rubbles are important for fish and things like that. But I think the other half of that problem is that the reason why diversity matters is also because of this idea of response diversity. So response diversity is when functionally similar species differ in their response to a disturbance. So now I'm looking, instead of like looking at across functional groups, I'm now looking within a functional group as I've, as I've laid it out. And the reason why this is important is because you may have heard of uh, issues like redundancy. Like we, we think of genetic redundancy in terms of like genes that, are, you know, there's lots of them, there's lots of redundancy, there's always one or a few that can do the job. Same with species, we have redundancy in species 
is good because some species can do the function when other species become uh, impacted. But there's a really important part of redundancy. For redundancy to matter, you have to have differences among those similar species in their, in their ecology and their response. Because if all of them die, then you lose the function of that group, right? So you need something that makes things different. Um, and so I'm gonna lay out the, I'm gonna quickly summarize the theory on response diversity, how response diversity links to resilience, or the capacity for a system to return to its previous state and maintain that state. In the case of corals, it might just be like coral cover. So, and, and what I wanna do later in the talk is go through the evidence that we're accumulating, which addresses these points. So, so the first thing is that, um, uh, So the idea is that if one species gets impacted by a disturbance, there's other species that perform the same function that can compensate for the temporary loss of that other species that's performing that function. So that's the, that's the principle. And for that to happen, we, need, we know we need to have different species respond differently to a given disturbance or stress or event, and different species respond differently to different stresses. So this might be like one species responds to disease, is impacted by disease, another species is impacted by bleaching. That's one criteria for, for how response diversity causes resilience. Uh, we, another aspect is that you need to have these functionally similar species occupy different areas of an environmental gradient or different spatial or different habitats because different habitats are prone to different types of disturbances. Um, so if you have a shallow water disturbance, you've got, you might have a deep water, deeper water refuge and, and so on. Um, and kind of related to that is that you need to have these species co-occurring over scales that are larger than the scale of larval dispersal. So that's the principle behind that is that a disturbance comes through, it's not gonna be over the entire geographic range of the species, it's gonna be a fraction of it. And you need to have other parts of its range to supply recruits to recover that area. And so by having these um, characteristics in place, uh, that's what, that this is how we can uh, achieve resilience through response diversity. Okay, so the problem with all that is that, especially when it comes to corals, we don't know very much at all about these differences, these ecological differences, these function, these, these important response diversity differences within coral species that share a similar trait. So if we think of like corombose corals, right? We kind of lump all the corals together and we kind of think they're all the same. We don't know the differences because we don't know what species they are. And, and the big problem with coral research is that a lot of hard, shallow, hard coral, shallow water research has lumped corals into genera, especially in the Indo-Pacific where there's hundreds of corals, right? So we tend to study biodiversity of corals at the genus level. We've been doing that for a long time because identifying species is really hard. So we don't know much because we can't identify species. When we go to the field, it's too hard. So we lump things together. Uh, we, and then of course, corals are notorious for hybridizing. And so actually defining those, bound, those species boundaries is really hard. And so this is really this gray or a continuum of where to draw the line for what are these units within a functional group that we expect to have asynchronous dynamics. And on the other hand, the good news is that with increasing technology to sequence DNA, the last 10 or 10 years or so, the more we sequence things, the more we realize that everything's a cryptic species. In lots of taxa, not just corals, in the bryzoans that I study, there's cryptic species. In the crown congo study, there's, well, we don't know if it's a species or a population, but there's, there's a lot of genetic structure in space. So it's a really common pattern that the more we're, we're finding increasing evidence for cryptic species in lots and lots of different important taxa. But the problem with that is that that field's kind of like just sequencing things and saying, oh, look, here's all the structure and here's the species. And they stop there and they're not doing the ecology. And then the ecologists are not doing the molecular work to you know, identify what they're studying. And so there's a bit of a mismatch right now. Uh, 
Okay. So here's what I want to do for that talk. I want to, this work I'm going to talk about is at Morea. So I just want to say, why do we work at Morea? Why do we go all the way to the South Pacific to work there? Uh, I want to talk about the, the morpho species problem in corals specifically and in Possilopora specifically, which is the genus of corals that I study. I want to talk about how we've uh, worked to figure out what we're studying. <laughs> we've done some thesis delimitation work and I uh, will set up the case that we know what we're looking at. And then I want to go through the evidence that we've been accumulating, accumulating over the last few years that I think provides that needed evidence to address that problem I just outlaid, that we have a good concept of response to diversity, but not much empirical evidence. And I think I, we've got some empirical evidence starting to emerge. Okay, so Morea, the, the context of Morea. Morea is an island in the South Pacific on the Eastern edge of the South Pacific. It's right near the island of Tahiti in the country of French Polynesia. It's located here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on Zoom, but so it's really at the edge of a large species richness gradient that's really high in the Indo-Pacific. There's about 800 species of coral and most of them are in the Indo-Pacific in the middle of the Indo-Pacific above Australia. And as you go further and further away, there's fewer and fewer species. But in those sort of marginal, marginal in terms of species richness, the reefs are really dominated by Postolopera. Postolopera corals are common on all Indo-Pacific reefs, but in that area, they're particularly common. So the island itself is about 60 kilometers circumference if you were to drive around it. So it's pretty big. It's, um, it's about one and a half to two and a half million years old, but there are atolls nearby. So there are older sort of stepping stones, if you like, in the whole country of French Polynesia, but the island itself is about that old. We work at four sites, sorry, six sites around the island, two on the North shore, two on the East shore, two on the West shore. And all of these sites are really, really different. So, you know, like a, a four reef just ain't a four reef. It, the aspect, there's lots of important differences among those sites. So one of the reasons why we work at Morea is because we, it's one location where we have fairly long-term data going back to at least the seventies here showing that the coral cover at Morea has gone through these characteristic cycles of decline from disturbances like cyclones or coral bleaching or crown of thorns sus fish predation. And it goes down because things happen and then it recovers after about 10 years and then it gets hit again and then it comes up again. And just well, in 2000, after 2010, there was crown of thorns starfish for three years, which ate all the corals. And then a cyclone came through and just cleared out all the reef. And it was just like bare pavement, hard rock. And then since around 2005, the NSF funded long-term ecological research site has been operating there. And again, showed it's come back. So this is when it was pavement in 2010 and it, it's the coral covers just shot back up to a really high percent cover. And it's dominated by Postal Opera. So this is a figure showing the different genus of coral. Again, see how they're lumping it to genus. <laughs> and this is just percent cover over time. And for at least 1990s, but for a long time, Postal Opera is the dominant coral. Now, I think it's even more dominant. The other corals like Acropora and Parides are not as common, but Postal Opera is really the dominant coral here. See what I mean? This is a photo of the, of the reef when it was really high coral cover. Pretty much every coral you can see there is a colony of Postal Opera, except I can see maybe one Acropora there and maybe something there, but you, know, you get the point. It's just like loaded with Postal Opera. So um, one of the, you know, the functions of Postal Opera, it has this complex, you know, it's called the cauliflower coral. So it has these sort of, you know, lobey branches with these big interstitial spaces. And it's got lots of trapezoid crabs and lots of different types of fish live in there and lots of different shrimp and all sorts of stuff lives in there. So it's important. And a lot of it's specific to Postal Opera too. So there's a lot of habitat that it creates for these type of small organisms. So as a group, that's, that's their function. So 
the morpho species problem in, in, in postal opera looks like this. Basically, we define species. Corals have been defined based on morphology, like the, the skeletal structure and what they look like. We've got a whole decades of research that's defined corals what they look like. But here's an example why it's problematic. This is a study that was published in 2014 where they took a coral that resembled the Postlopera meandrina phenotype. So if you looked at that coral, you'd say, oh, that's Postlopera meandrina. Then they moved it to a low light, low flow regime, and it started growing like a Postlopera demicornis phenotype. So it grew to look like another coral. So there's exceptional plasticity. Here's another example. This is the same colony that's been tracked over time in, I think this is in the Eastern Pacific. And basically there was a, um, a, a hurricane or storm event that created a lot of sedimentation and it changed the water quality, it changed the light. And this coral grew to become Damacornis coral. And then it grew into what they're calling the inflator morphology. So if you were to survey the coral at that time, you'd call it a different species. Then this same coral then went back to a different morphology after it kind of, after the water cleared up. So there's exceptional morphological plasticity within this genus that makes morphology practically useless. So this is what we're dealing with when we study these corals. We go down, the, the, the bottom's covered with postlopera and we see these two corals and we go, well, what is it? We're we gonna lump them into postlopera or we're we gonna try and identify them. Um, have a look at those. What would you think they are? Just based on, even if you don't know corals, then consider these two corals. What's going on here? Is that four species? Is that two species? Is color diagnostic? Is there some sort of microstructure that we can hone in on? Um, so we've genetically, we've taken tissue from these exact corals and we've got genetic IDs for them. And it comes, turns out like this. Those two on the left are a single species. Those two on the right are a single species. And it should be pretty clear that it's not really matching it to any sort of obvious phenotype diagnostic character. Now there's another, there's other types of morphologies on Moray and you go, oh, fine, we can identify these other species, right? Because they look very different. This bottom row looks very different to the top row. I'm pretty comfortable with that, right? So what do we have here? Is that three species or two? Well, again, it comes out like this when you do the genetics, that one there on the bottom left is actually the same as that, those top two, even though it looks completely different. And to me, it kind of looks like that one on the far right except that one on the far right is a different species. And it's similar to that other thing, which looks nothing like it. These two in the middle on the bottom, that's kind of like this map, this big morphology. That's two species as well. They look the same, but they're different species. And we know that because we've done the genetics. So sometimes the term cryptic species is a contentious word, but what I mean by it is that similar looking corals are sometimes different species and different looking corals are sometimes the same species. So there's exceptional phenotypic plasticity, morphological plasticity, and a lot of overlap in the species in, the, the, in their characters. So when you're studying them in the field, which is what really I care about really, because I just want to identify them, they're cryptic. So if you don't believe me how bad it is, I still have colleagues that try to go out and I myself are guilty of this. I've worked in the past where I've done a study on what I thought was Postlopera varicosa. And then when we do the genetics on it, we find we have multiple species. So this is just one example of that, where we thought we had Postlopera varicosa, we did the genetics and we had four species in there. And only 5% of the samples were actually the name Postlopera that we thought it was. So it's pretty bad. Um, there's another example where uh, colleagues went out and they decided to take the, the three types of morphology, like the, the big morphology, the, the smaller little one, and this other little one, which we thought we could tell apart. And again, there's multiple species in the mix. There's pretty much an even you know, distribution of all of those species in each of the morphological ones. And so it's a complete mess. And importantly, those red numbers are nowhere near 100%. So the question is, is does that matter? Like as an ecologist, we might be like, well, can we still lump them? Is that okay? And I don't think we know, but we're still, we're kind of working on that. And, and what I'm gonna show is that for the things that we've done, it does matter. Okay, so how do we identify them? Well, we actually use an old mitochondrial marker called ORF, 
stands for open reading frame. It's a protein coding region with unknown function. And um, it's been used for a while in postal opera. And it turns out it's a pretty good species marker. We've validated it and I'll show you that in a minute. But um, what I'm showing here is a haplotype network. So the size of that bubble ref reflects the number of samples. Um, the dots indicate the number of base pair differences between each variant. And basically we use the ORF marker to assign corals to a haplotype and haplotypes have a name and, a, and, and we know how they're organized. Um, we know that this particular haplotype actually has two species in it. And so Erica Johnson actually developed a quick restriction fragment length polymorphism assay where you, you basically sequence the, or you, you do a PCR on the histone gene in the, in the nuclear genome. And it creates two bands. If it's one species or one band, if it's another species on a gel. So it's super quick and easy and it's validated the sequencing. So that's the kind of quick way we do it. Um, but the only, you know, you'd be pretty aware that a mitochondrial marker in, in corals and anthozoans that evolves really slowly. They're usually not very good at diagnosing species. And, you know, you, you can't do species limitation any, anymore with one marker. So we've, um, we've used multiple approaches to validate or to eliminate species at Morea. And again, I want to acknowledge Erica Johnson, a lot of this work, she's really been incredibly good at this and an important contributor. So we've generated restriction site associated DNA libraries using the EasyRAD protocol. We've done Bayesian phylo phylogenies of the whole mitochondrial genome mapped to a reference genome. We've done Bayesian phylo phylogenies of catenated genomic loci mapped to another reference genome. We've done species trees using several thousand unlinked SNPs. We've also done like clustering methods or DAPC on many more thousands of SNPs. Um, and all of these different approaches, it was the same library, but we've filtered different ways. We've done all these different analytical methods and we've come up with the same um, conclusions. And so what that allows us to do is to go back to using the old marker, like the simple ORF marker, um, sequence that, figure out what haplotype is, it is, and now we can kind of map it to, we know how those haplotypes organize to species. The other evidence we have is from the algal symbionts. And this is really a story for a whole nother talk, but it's, it's just been published. But basically we also sequence the algae in these coral tissues using two approaches, using multiple methods as well. And we found evidence that for a co-phylogeny, meaning the, the postal opera phylogeny mirrors the algal phylogeny, which not only provides support for the coral species ID, but it's also an interesting story about co-diversification in the algae and how the algae are following speciation in the corals and things like that. So this is one of those analyses. This is the snap tree. This is a species tree using the unlinked SNP, SNPs. Um, Eric has shown that the current extinct postal opera are a monophyletic radiation that have a, uh, that originate from, from about 3 million years ago. Um, basically, all of these methods lead us to this. We, we, we have six species at Morea. So all of that history of Morea showing corals, there's at least six species. Um, we have this group we call the type three, which we, we normally put the name postal opera varicosa on it. We don't even know if it is varicosa because we can't sequence the, the museum specimen. So the names that are associated with it are less important to me than the actual knowledge that it's a group. We have this other thing, which is called charismatically haplotype 10, but it was never, this haplotype has only been found at Morea and surrounding islands. And all of our genomic work, we're pretty convinced it's a different species. And so we're actually in the process now of describing this species and it's currently in review, but we think it's a new species. We think it's endemic to Morea, or sorry, to French Polynesia so far, though the sampling's not that good around that area. So it could be wider, we don't know, but um, we called it, we want to call it Tuahiniensis, which is based on the Tahitian word for, for sister, um, because it's a sister taxa of a, a sister taxa at Morea. Uh, we have this other species called Postlopa grandis, which is one that we have to use this additional test for. We have Postlopa meandrina, and we have this other thing called Postlopa effusa. And these two, this species here is actually, we think, some hybridization between these 
evolutionary distinct mitochondrial lineages, which we think are older because mitochondria evolves much slower in coral. So these are older divergences that we think are coming back into secondary contact and are hybridizing and possibly introgressing now. So, you know, they're separate kind of lineages in the mitochondrial sense, but we kind of treat them as one and there's a hybridizing group. There's another interesting group here with this effusus thing. Most of the corals in this group are from haplotype 11, but, and I think this is a haplotype that might be either speciating at present from at the moment, or one that was an old lineage again, that's coming back into secondary contact, but haplotype 11 has also only been found at in French Polynesia. So there's two species here that are only found in that area. And then there's this other thing called Postlopa acuta, which is a brooding coral. And all the other corals are spawning corals. These ones are brooding corals, but it's also only on the uh, back reef. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about the evidence for response diversity now. And one of the evidences, one of the lines of evidence that I told you about was having different species in different habitats and different locations. And so this is basically what we see. So we've done sampling at four sites around the island across these uh, really sharp environmental gradients from the fringing reef near the land to the back reef lagoon, which is about two meters depth, and then to different depths on the fore reef. And we've done that in four transects around the island. We've done this in two years now, and we found this, we found similar things. This is a really sharp environmental gradient in terms of the variation in temperature. So the temperature in the, in the shallows is really variable, and at deep it's less variable. Um, it varies a lot in terms of light. It varies a lot in terms of wave energy and currents and sedimentation, all these other environmental variables that kind of provide the context for why things structure across this gradient. And what I'm showing here is each of the different species. On this axis, on the y-axis, there is the proportion of postlopera at a given habitat. So if you can't read that, that's basically the fringing reef, the lagoon, the four reef, five meters, four reef, 10 meters, four reef, 20 meters. And it's the proportion of postlopera that belong to that particular species at that place. And so you see this really stark pattern that this species has this nice hump shape pattern where it's locally abundant in the five meter four reef habitat, though it does occur across the entire gradient. There's another species here which looks exactly like this species, but it has a very, very different environment relative abundance across that gradient. The, the y axis is different on here because there's because these three in the middle, if you can see my cursor, those three are relatively rare. Um, so that's why the, the axis changes, but you can still detect this signal of, of difference. This species here is really morphologically different to Ferricosa, but it has, again, it tends to be common in the fringing reef in the shallow areas. You've got this haplotype 11, which is not really found in the back reef, it's always on the fore reef. And this other thing, this Tuahiniensis species, that's the one that's really common deep. So if you go down to about 20 meters, pretty much all the corals at 20 meters are this one species but they, uh, they do occur in the back reef, which is wildly different. Postlopera at Morea go down to about 60 meters, I think, and I'm pretty sure that all the corals down at, to 60 meters of this species. And then you've got this other weird thing, which is, is brooding coral, which is only found in the fringing reef. So you've got this big niche partitioning in terms of these environmental gradients. So that's one component of response diversity, but it's also an interesting story for speciation and how how do similar species coexist? Well, they're separating the niche here. Okay, so um, the, the other part of the title to my talk was to talk about the, the heat wave and that happened at Morea in 2019. So I'm gonna start going into the evidence for actual response diversity and the differences amongst the species in their response to thermal stress. And this work was somewhat serendipitous in the sense that we had sites set up before the bleaching for another project we just got funding for. We didn't know bleaching was gonna happen, but it did. And so we were able to get samples before and samples after and look at the change. And so this is a photo I took in February in 2019. Um, it was a beautiful reef, lots of different corals. And then unfortunately in May, it got hot and everything bleached and it looked like this white area. <clears throat> 
When you zoom in, you can see uh, a lot of these corals are bleached, but what I want to draw your attention to is notice how the corals that are bleached happen to be really large in size, happen to be really big. So it looks like a lot of corals bleach, but if you look carefully, there's a lot of small corals in here that didn't bleach. Okay, and I'm not going to do Agatha Christie on you. The punchline is, is that there are different species, right? But, um, you know, if, if you didn't go to the trouble of delineating this, you'd miss this whole story. In August, when we went back after the bleaching, we, we see that these big brown corals are, have since died from bleaching because they're now covered in turf algae. That's why they're brown. And you see lots of other corals which maintain their color and are still existing. So the point of that is that we know why the coral died because we had the same coral tract before and after. So we know it was bleaching and not other, some other factor. So our sampling was we had sites set up in February we were able to collect tissue from 68 colonies, which is not a lot, admittedly, but we got, you know, was sort of as many as we could. But we also have thousands of corals that we've tagged, but we didn't have the genetic genome at that time. We came back in February, we, have, we had permanent plots, so I'd mark them with a steel rod in, this, in the rock, so I could go back to that exact site. I've taken photo quadrats, so I, every coral has an ID, and I've tracked thousands of corals individual colonies over time. And we're still doing that now, but um, that's allowed us to look at mortality. We also have a separate data set from corals that were collected during the bleaching to quantify the, the extent of bleaching, but unfortunately, no, not much genetic samples. So as you saw from the photos and I drew your attention to, we find data that supports this observation that the larger the colony size was in terms of this is this is the longest diameter just 2d diameter the more the higher probability that that coral was bleached in in may and you can kind of see these quadrats here it's pretty clear that the big corals died uh, bleached okay in fact 72 percent of the corals of the postlop were bleached and this was only after 22 days of severe heating the different lines here are just the different degrees of bleaching. So basically it didn't matter about the degree of bleaching, it was the same, it was the same pattern. This is how we characterize degree of bleaching. Bigger corals bleached more. Okay. And as we showed in the images, the observation was that bigger corals died more. So this is the data set where we've tracked individual colonies, thousands of individual colonies, this is just two sites, and shown that bigger corals also died. And here's just an, a visual example of that where this big coral was alive and now it's clearly dead or in these other smaller corals were alive and they're still alive okay so but the story is is that of course those big corals were a different species right so um we from those from those genetic samples we all if we pulled them all together and ignored the genetic work uh, mortality increases with size but when you color code the samples, so each line here is a sample, it gets as one if it's alive, zero, sorry, one if it's dead, zero if it's alive. And all of the corals that died were of this haplotype 11 species and to a lesser extent haplotype two, which together form a species. So it's just far fewer haplotype two at Maria. So the only ones that died in this sample were that one species. That species, if there was a postlopera larger than 30 centimeters, it was always that species. That species also has small corals. Let me go to here first. That species also has small corals. And if you look at the probability of dying as a small coral from that species, there's no relationship with size. So even the smallest and the largest died, it's just that those colonies that were large happened to be that species. So this is, I think, really important because if you didn't, consider the cryptic species thing, you would probably erroneously conclude that there's some sort of demographic effect or like the larger corals of the population who are the reproductive powerhouses, if you like, are more susceptible to bleaching than small corals. And you'd be searching for like mechanistic explanations for why a large colony bleaches. But we going to the trouble of identifying the species has shown us that it's actually just differences among species. So that's the question we should be asking. Not, nothing mechanistically about size, it's why did that species bleach? It also leads to a different interpretation of, of change because it means that the 
it's uh, it's not a within species effect. It means that the community is to sh is changing. The post lover community is changing over time. So it's it's becoming. It was really dominated by post lover eleven, and it's seen a drastic decline in that, with and relatively little decline in every other species. So it's an issue about you know it's a community change effect. It's not a mechanistic related to size. We do have some samples of bleaching. So one question was like, I didn't show you if the, so the, so the question is, did corals that died, were they also more likely to bleach? Or did everything bleach, but then the others recovered and only, possible, only have type 11 died? Well, the samples that we have tend to show that most of the other colonies also did not bleach. Some of them did, but not all of them. So the patterns of bleaching reflect the patterns of mortality. So it's not like their ability to recover from bleaching. It's more that they bleach and then die, as opposed to the other corals, which just didn't bleach. So this is our interpretation of what actually happened at Maria. When you see a scene like that, it's really just a cryptic species thing. All of those big corals that you see are just one species. All of the things you see in the middle, if you look carefully, that didn't bleach are another group. And what's interesting about that is that this size dependent bleaching pattern at the genus level has been found previously at Morea. This is a study that was based on the bleaching in 2007. And again, every coral is pulled by genus and you can see the postlopera, there's a massive size effect of bleaching. Um, and we think that's again, driven by the same thing we're finding. We think that's those big corals are all that one species. So this has happened before. So one question is why did that species bleach more than the other ones? Um, was it related to symbiont ID? So uh, this is a uh, species tree of the PSBA marker of the algal symbionts. Okay, and so each branch, you don't worry about reading the text, it's far too small, but the color codes are, so the samples are coded by the color of the host. So the color reflects the species of the host. The tree though is the algae tree, okay? Um, postal opera have two species of, of cladocopium that are only found in postal opera. They're not free living and they're only in these two species. These, there's, there's cladocopium latosorum, which is this group of corals. And then there's cladocopium pacificum, which is only in this group of corals. This group of corals here contains three, at least three species of coral. But what I want to draw your attention to is this green one here, or this, we're calling them clays, but whatever, this, this branch here is all of the samples that were haplotype 11. Okay, so haplotype 11 appears to have a particular genetic variant of Latosorum that the other colonies tend to not have. So that's a correlation, it's not causation, but I think it provides a good starting point to start doing some functional work about is that particular genetic variant more or less susceptible to bleaching and you know, what's, what's going on there with genetic variability within cladocopium species. Um, so all of that co-phylogeny work we've done, we can summarize in this cartoon schematic here, where on the right-hand side is the coral phylogeny, so on the left-hand side is coral phylogeny, on the right-hand side is the platycopium phylogeny. And basically we're only seeing bleaching in that top kind of branch of the, of the phylogeny. And so I we have no mechanism, there's no explanation, it's all arm waving, but that's, I think we're starting to, it, it provides a good starting point to figure out what's going on there. Okay, the other thing, the other lines of evidence that I talked about was having um, spatial variation in the, distribution of the of the of the species and in their impact from the disturbance so here is the same data on probability of bleaching with size at all the sites around the island before i was just showing you how the, the the north shore where we have most samples for but this is every site around the island so this is the the thousands of corals that we've tracked and this is mortality from before and after the bleaching the top two sites is what i just showed you these two middle sites, site three and four, are on this shore, and these two bottom sites are on this shore, and we see different relationships between bleaching and size. And you guessed it, those different relationships are, are caused, are related to the fact that at 
site three. So at site one, there was lots of haplotype 11 before the bleaching. At site three, before the bleaching, there just wasn't that many haplotype 11 before the bleaching. And as a result, we saw really low mortality and we saw no relationship with size. So that provides other evidence that we think that those sites just didn't have that much, many of the haplotype that are susceptible to bleaching. And on the other shores, we find that there was lots of haplotype 11 and there also was that size relationship with bleaching. So the extent of mortality from bleaching depends on where the, the distribution of cryptic species. So again, and you know, what that means is that different sites, the community at different sites changes differently. Sites that had lots of haplotype 11 before the bleaching, their composition changed to, to be similar to sites that didn't have lots of haplotype 11 before and after the bleaching. Sites that had no haplotype 11 to start with, their composition hardly changed at all. And it's all driven by the composition of cryptic species. Okay, so I just said it's all driven by the composition of cryptic species, but there's another layer of complexity here is that the magnitude of heating also varied at really fine spatial scales around the island. And so that's another part of this story is that the sites that had fewer haplotype 11 before the bleaching also happened to have relatively lower heating stress. Now, whether that's maybe, maybe that's whether that's why haplotype 11 were, were not there or whatever, I don't know, but it makes the story more complicated. This is showing degree heating days over the duration of time. And you can see the accumulated heat being um, differing among sites. It's not a whole lot. It's still pretty severe everywhere, but it's a bit of a slight differences anyway. Um, this is what NOAA called moderate, and this is what NOAA calls severe risk of bleaching. And so it was really quite a lot higher than what NOAA calls severe bleaching. It was a significant stress. There was lots of thermal stress. The other thing I want to draw your eyes to is see this little black line here. That black line comes from the estimate of accumulated heat from satellites. The satellite SST data from sea surface temperature, it completely missed the, bleach, the, the thermal stress at Morea. The data that I'm showing in the colors comes from um, loggers that are, are literally bolted onto the reef, literally 20 meters away from the sites that we're studying. So it's like the, the temperatures that the corals are actually experiencing. And it's nothing like what is seen from satellites averaged over large spatial scales. I think that's a really important point. It's like, if you were doing a meta-analysis of like thermal stress and bleaching, this sea surface temperature would show it wasn't that bad, but it actually was. So um, to go into a, a little bit of oceanography, what actually happened here, and this is led by my colleagues, Alex Wyatt and Jim Leichter, but there is internal waves happening at Morea. This is, this is their story, right? And so these, at depth, you've got these cold water internal waves, which kind of bathe the bottom of reefs. And so at depth on the fore reef, there's lots of variability in temperature. And at the shallows, it's less variability. And what happened, the reason why it bleached, they think, is because those internal waves shut down through some sort of macro oceanography phenomena, basically the dynamics of big warm core eddies and whether it licks past Morea or not. Basically, the internal waves shut down and then the thermocline just dropped down to 40 meters. And from zero to 40 meters, it got really hot. And the signature of that is when you look at the variance in the temperature. So before the bleaching, the variance was really high. So that's what these big squiggles here mean. And then during it, it got really low and really low. And that was the sort of physical mechanism for the heating here. Um, so basically the 2019 heat wave at Murray was hidden below the surface. And I mean hidden because it was hidden from satellites. Whereas in 2016, the satellites picked it up. In fact, this here is showing the data that Alex has done, analyzed from 2016, this is the scale at which SST are measuring temperature. It's huge, right? And it's covering multiple islands and we're like got six sites and this tiny speck of pixel right here. And this satellite data picked up the, it picked up the stress in 2016 and it was really not that deep. There was still internal wave cooling 
and the stress and it's still cool at depth. And as a result, in 2016, it only bleached on the lagoon, but it didn't bleach on the fore reef. Whereas in 2019, it didn't bleach in the lagoon, but it bleached on the fore reef. And whoops. So the stories you hear from Marae are entirely contextualized by where, if it's fore reef or back reef. And they're very, very different, even though the corals themselves occur across both. So this is looking at depth. Basically, you can see that the satellite, this here is the satellite not picking up the image, but the loggers showed that there was a really deep thermocline at the time of bleaching down to like 40 meters. Okay, let me wrap all this up. So <clears throat> what do I think this means for corals at Morea specifically? I think this is a body of work that shows some empirical evidence for response diversity. So it, it is, I think, consistent with some of what the, the quantitative theory is predicting about whether response diversity is the thing, whether it matters. Uh, I think that's what we're seeing at Morea. Um, I think we've provided that critical link between showing response diversity and all these other evidence that you need to make a case for it affecting resilience. You can't just show that different corals do different things. You have to build this other case with these other criteria that the theory says is important. The distribution across habitat is interesting, not for speciation, but it's also a way that ecologically similar species can coexist. You know, you classic competition coexistence theory, you either have to have different fitness differences or different niche differences. And so if, they're, if cryptic species have very similar fitness to each other, the only way they can coexist is if they have different niches. Otherwise, one will competitively exclude, exclude the other one. Because it does raise the interesting question, like if they're so similar, why hasn't one just competitively excluded everything? And I think that the distribution across habitat is one mechanism that they're partitioning the niche. Um, we've shown the importance of really fine scale variability that you have to measure by going on dives and changing out loggers and not using satellite data. And the spatial scale of dispersal is probably larger than the you know, few hundreds of meters, few kilometers that our sites are separated by. We don't know the scale of dispersal yet, but we think it's probably larger because of the pelagic larval durations, probably at least a few days, at least. Um, and, and, I, and I think that um, haplotype 11 is, is one of the species that's driving this, this recovery that we're seeing. So it's, it's colonizing space really well. This is what's happened. Uh, it was unusually high recruitment that's driven this big increase in coral cover. It's a good colonizer. It grows really fast. It tends to make bigger colonies, but it also seems to be susceptible. So time will tell if, if, if the re recovery we see now is that species or not. And, so we're just apparently seeing recruits this year. And so we're doing a big settlement plate study and we're trying to figure that out. Looking forward in time, what does that mean? Well, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily a good news species. I'm not saying that, oh, look, isn't this great that not every coral bleached? Uh, if you wanted to, you could pick that up and spin it and say like, oh, coral reefs are safe because some of the corals didn't bleach. That's a good thing. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of pessimistic spin is that the coral that did bleach was one that was endemic to or only been sampled from French Polynesia. So even though, even though it's locally common, it has a really restricted geographic range, we think. And so the bad news spin is that there's a particularly vulnerable species here that's prone to extinction because marine heat waves have become more frequent, more severe, and more larger in scale. And all of those things erode response diversity. The largest scale re removes the capacity for unimpacted sites to recover impacted sites. The intensity of the disturbance removes the potential for species to differ in their response. Basically, I think everything's just going to die if it gets hotter. I don't think response diversity is going to save corals. But I think looking back, it has been an explanation for it. Um, one interesting Im implication of this is that um, the last few years, there has been some local restoration efforts led by a group called the Coral Gardeners at Morea, and they are um, doing a lot of restoration work. It's a, it's a bunch of uh, local people that are trying to do something active to you know, kickstart the recovery of these reefs that are impacted by climate change, and they're growing all these coral fragments, right? And so they're doing a cropper and proslopera, and I think we're starting, my colleague Pete Evans has been talking to them for a while, and we're hopefully starting to build up this collaboration where we can like genetically identify their corals and then 
help them figure out where to sample the corals and where to grow them and where to outplant them and um, that sort of thing. Because like what I would worry about is that if they're collecting all of those haplotype 11 colonies, then everything in their nursery will die if it's that vulnerable species. And so we want to be able to say like, don't collect those, collect those, things like that. So I think there's some interesting um, applications for the work in that respect. More generally, I just wanted to comment on, um, on, on the importance of response diversity is that Morea is in a low species richness zone. It has really low functional diversity. The main coral is that one type, right? Functionally, it has really low diversity. Um, and we tend to think that that's a problem. But in these places, that low diversity, I think, is maintained or it's still important because of response diversity. So it could help explain why we see this big cycle of disturbance and recovery in a system with really low functional diversity in terms of the morphology of the coral. And I just want to point out that um, for the ecologist, you know, it's not just about putting a name on things. This cryptic, identifying cryptic species is important, not just for taxonomy. It, it matters ecologically. And I hope I've made that case. Um, and just sort of a final reflection is that had we not done this work, we would have led to incredibly different interpretations of what we're seeing, you know, the ecological changes that we're seeing. We would have thought there was different amounts of gene flow for estimating that. We think there's lots of genetic variation when in fact there's not because there's just different species and so on. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap it up there. I wanna thank you for listening. There are several people that helped with this work, including Jackson Powell, PhD student in my lab, the Florida State University DS, DSO, Dive Safety Officer Chris Peters has been really important and helpful to this work and uh, has been great. I've had excellent undergraduates that are painstakingly analyze all these images. And on that point, I'll leave it there and take questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.